Hello, everyone. Welcome to my interview with Gerardo Duenas. We don't have the tilty over the end because the software wouldn't let me put the tilty, but it's really Duenas and not Duenas, right? Right, Geraldo? That's right, but uh, I have been around the United States in, in different occasions of my life, and sometimes was Gerardo Duenas. Then it's Jerry, and I think I want to be fully bilingual, and that makes it Jerry Owners. <laughs> <laughs> Jerry Owners. Well, the name <laughs> Rivera means riverbank, so they could call me Rudy Banks. Rudy Banks, so okay. Yeah. We got it, okay. <laughs> Well, thank you everyone for joining us and please subscribe to uh, my channel. We're going to have a number of interviews throughout the year. Today, my I'm extremely proud to have Gerardo Duenas, who is the owner and the founder of Entropia in Spanish and Entropy uh, in, in English. Uh, he is a consultant. He is a teacher of negotiation. He provides... Um, in Spanish is capacitación, but training in HR, also training in, in processes that a company can use to enhance better production. And what I find interesting about my, my friend Geraldo is that he is an engineer by profession. That's right. Uh, Geraldo, can you tell us a little bit about your trajectory and how it is you got to this point becoming a, a, a motivational speaker a, a trainer, a teacher? Well, um, first of all, thank you, Rudy, for this opportunity to, to chat. And also thank you to the all the audience for their interest in. I will try to make it the most uh, useful and the most joyful interview I can give at this time of the year. Well, let me tell you, I'm from Baja California. Well, better known in the United States as Baja, especially for California. Um, I say that I was born and never raised. And in Spanish, it's a better joke. Yo nací en Ensenada y no crecí en ningún lado. I was born in Ensenada and never grew. But in, in, in Spanish makes a lot of sense for a joke. And then... Basically, studied in Mexico City, in Tijuana, of course, and also uh, I went to UNAM, Univer National University of Mexico, and it's a well-renowned, it's the best uh, college in Latin America, one of the best in the world, and I'm proud to be from the UNAM. We call the Los Pumas, the Cougars. And when I was in, in, in military school in Anaheim, California, yes, there's something more than, than Disneyland in Anaheim. And I was in a military school over there. And it was kind of great to be the Cougars. And then I went all my life and, and ended up in college being from the Cougars. So it makes a lot of sense. And as a chemical engineer, let me tell you something about chemical engineering. There is more than refineries, more than processes, more than a lot of tools, a lot of uh, layouts and whatever you sense about chemical engineering. A great chemical engineer from Mexico, the great Benito Buca said in one of his classes in, in, in my master's degree, that the chemical engineering is the, the most technical of the humanities and the more human of the engineering. How about that? So it's, Chemical so, engineers deal with processes. They build the machines that run the chemicals, where the, the chemist is, deals with the chemicals, right? The compounds. Yeah. And the chemicals has the same behavior as, the, as, the, as, as people have, okay? Sometimes we're boiling, sometimes we're freezing, sometimes we're flowing, sometimes we're stuck, sometimes, sometimes, sometimes. So if you understand processes, if you understand thermodynamics, remember physics and mathematics are not, most in science are philosophy. So that makes you a lot of sense in understanding processes. So you, you start up being a 
chemical engineering being in a plant, then you go to management. I went to being in marketing, sales, logistics, customer service, and culture, corporate culture, total quality management. This is an expression from the 80s. It's continuous improvement has survived that, that management term. And starting being process and process and applying my my focus, applying my point of view, and applying my skills in mapping a process. In a chemical plant, you say, I'm going to put here the pump, I'm going to here put here the bulb, and I'm going to put the reactor in the center. It's the same with people. Where people it's can be. So, so it's not what we call a stretch to say you went from being an engineer to a negotiator, a trainer, because those are really processes. And what I've noticed about you, uh, Geraldo, that's different than, than others is that you seem to take a somewhat scientific approach to negotiation, scientific approach to processing, which is what I find very fascinating. You treat it more as, it's not an art, but you treat it more like a science. Is that a fair statement? It's, it's very accurate, my dear Rudy. Uh, one of my certifications is from ProSci, Professional Science Applied to Business. And this and ProSci is a company, well-known company worldwide, about change management. You have to apply science, but you have to apply art. What I do in executive education, in training, in, in transformation of people and human resources is a concept I developed with what we are um, considering in this interview is five skills. I name it that way worldwide. Doesn't matter, everybody understands English and skill is a very powerful word term. Number one, leadership. You need leadership. Number two, you need communication. Nothing can be done without communication. No matter how you do it, WhatsApp, TikTok, you name it. Handwritten, using your mouth, a big horn. Doesn't matter, communication. Number three, number three is science. You have to put uh, a, a methodology based on science. But you're dealing with people, okay? You need also art. And finally, strategy. Without a strategy, nothing can happen, okay? The basic thing in the strategy is to know what to do and what not to do, okay? So those five skills, I think, that make you a very strong professional, make you a most of all, make you a great human being if you want to go into business. To me, uh, your five skills, or the five, uh, I call them the five pillars that you teach, are interchangeable with any company. Because any what company, you, any person, any situation, is you have to look at that. What I find in people I deal with is they're generally lacking sometimes two or three of those skills they're lacking often the communication they're also lacking the the strategy um, but all of that requires one simple premise is that you have to be prepared you cannot implement any of those five pillars unless you're prepared correct that's right you know what is a definition of skill that is very useful for me and has that science approach to management in any part of our lives, is that skill is when you demonstrate, when you prove to yourself and others the knowledge you have acquired. Okay, I have been in college. I have the knowledge, but I don't have the skill. Okay. I, I view a skill as the application of your knowledge. That's right. Absolutely right. I, I'm 100% agree with you. You can know a lot of things, but if you don't know how to apply them, then 
the knowledge is fun, but you can't transmit that to somebody else. That's and, and, and in your business, you need to be able to transmit that. You need to be able to help them develop those skills, correct? That's right. And and, and if you say I don't have the knowledge, so I, I I will never have the skill, you're making a double mistake. Double error, like in tennis. Double fault. The double fault is you're making acquire the knowledge and commit yourself to transform it into your skill. And the skills goes on and on, behaviors, habits, uh, and results. At the end of the day, we need results. If you don't put knowledge into skill, you will never get results. You well, it's it. interesting that you and I, had Aldo, come from two different backgrounds. You are a chemical engineer. I am a lawyer. But our processes are the same. Because as a lawyer, I analyze, I look at the facts, I then maybe apply those facts to the law, and 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 that's where we go. You, as an engineer, do the research. You have to understand all the possible hypotheses, correct? And then you have to then figure out how you're going to implement it in that process. But and, as starting at the beginning, starting at the beginning is knowing what the issue is, knowing what the problem is. Let me tell you something. The original uh, legal entity of Entropia was myself and three lawyers. And and the three lawyers were with myself because we have a same point of view about work, about processes, but one thing very important. They wanted to do something different than being a lawyer. And I wanted to do something different than being a chemical engineer. And that's when, when, when you open to other facts, I learned a lot about uh, the law. In fact, part of my success stories has been in compliance. You know, compliance is the place where everything melts. Okay, lawyers, process, engineering, whatever it requires, sometimes pharmaceutical, sometimes medical, but it's interchange. Okay. And, and I love, uh, I love, uh, I love lawyers. Don't tell everybody, but I love lawyers. Well, so do I. I love lawyers too. <laughs> you better, you better, <laughs> you must. Well, I, I believe uh, strongly in what you're saying because, but I would disagree in one sense. You never stop being a lawyer. You never stop being an engineer. That's embedded in you. What, That's what you end up doing is you end up taking your skills as an engineer or your skills as a lawyer and transforming them to something else i love i love that you will always be an engineering you have to exactly. be you you have to to always remember your essence always be truthful with yourself and do it okay and that's and and, and and break the boundaries, okay? No, I'm an engineer. And I understand the law. You better understand it, man. I don't understand economics. You better do it. You know, when I was in master's, my master's degree. Come on, guys, you have to learn economics, account accounting, uh, everything, learning, learning, and everything together gives you. As I said, and I, I, I sure you will agree, give you results. But your essence, your essence is how you practice your talent. You have a basic it's knowledge. Apply, yeah, it's how you apply what you know. That's really where the talent is, isn't it? How you apply what you know. And and and, and, and I love I love a bachelor's degree in in, in the United States in the college. Because you have a major and have a minor, and you and, and you have and not with professionals that have a major in in engineering and a minor in arts. That's beautiful. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I, my my major was political science and Spanish. In the United States, a law degree is an advanced degree. But what I've learned, for example, as a practicing lawyer, 
is it is a chameleon profession. It is a chameleon because you have to learn about a lot of other things that are not within the discipline of law, but the process is still the same. Just like you being an engineer, your processes would apply to a business unit head, to somebody implementing, you know, some type of compliance process because those thought processes are the same. And I'll tell you a funny story. I thought, why do I need math when I was a young student? Because I'm going to be a lawyer. Why do I need math? Well, in a simple automobile accident case, okay, uh, a car traveling at 45 miles an hour is traveling 60 feet per second. And if it takes you three quarters of a second to apply the brakes, the car will have traveled, I don't know how many feet. And you have to look, when I first had to learn that, oh my God, you mean I'm never going to get away from math. So I've learned to embrace it. In the 40 years I've been a lawyer, I've had to learn many, many different things. But based, you know, but I still apply the training you have as a lawyer. So that I think is is a big difference. Uh, and Ando, I want to talk to you about something that's interesting on your website. And that's, you say, liderazgo, leadership. Leader. Okay. And that's one of your pillars. You list leadership, communication, science, art, and strategy. But what I think it's most fleeting for people is the concept of leadership. You know, what is leadership? There, there are people who are bosses and they rule with an autocratic, you know, will. You do what I say because I'm the boss. And then there are those who lead by example. And then there are those that let their 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 subordinates uh, develop themselves. You know that's also a sign of leadership. Tell us how you train people in leadership and what's your definition of leadership. Well, the training, I mean, getting the skills in leadership depends on on the on the um, on the discipline. I have three disciplines that are negotiation, change management, and execution. But uh, but besides that. Leadership is, has very useful definitions. The, the one I like most is from Eisenhower, a very popular president from the United States. <laughs> okay. And I love that we have audience in the US, in the States, I will know this, this, this phrase. Leadership is to make others do what you want to do because they wanted to do it. That I think is a sign of a good leader. You can force people to do something or you can make them want to. That's a sign of a leader. For me, a word that's synonymous with leader is a motivator. A leader is a person who motivates. That's, that's for sure because if you, I say in, in my courses and my book and whatever you, I'm present and you can hear me, is that Communication is the sister because of, 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 of the spelling and, and, and meaning in, in Spanish, comunicación, la comunicación is a, uh, Communication is sister of leadership. The two brothers, it's like Hansel and Gretel. <laughs> okay. They you, can, you, cannot have, you, you cannot have leadership unless you have communication. And you don't, and nobody will hear you if you're not a leader. Okay. Because you have what? credibility and that's a result of leadership being a leader is to take the opportunities when you see it being a leader is to control yourself being a leader is killing like eisenhower killing the ego okay that's that's right a leader with a big ego is not necessarily a good leader it's not a leader it's it's a kind of um a dictator. Well, it's a dictator if you go to political science and you dominate that 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 discipline. A leader that obligates or whatever is not a leader. I, I let me let me let me uh, give me my my my, my impression uh, because of my professional knowledge regarding negotiation. I had to read the book from mr trump i'm the, the, art, big, of the, the art of the deal the of the and he starts up by saying 
I'm the greatest negotiator in the world that has ever been. Nothing like me. <laughs> so whenever it stands up and say I'm the leader, something's going wrong. Something's going wrong. Okay. And many, many companies want leadership. They don't want leadership. You cannot go to CBS. Sorry for for the publicity. You cannot go to any uh, drugstore and say, I want leadership. You cannot have a prescription of leadership from a consultant like me. And everybody goes and says, I want leadership for my for my team. For all. What we understand about leadership is thinking like a leadership. The mind of leadership. And as well, if you go to the to the to the to the final skill of my model, that is a strategy. Everybody thinks, let's be a strategic. What I think, what they are talking about is having a strategic thinking. No matter if you are in objectives, tactics, or whatever strategic. So let's get back to leadership. What companies want is to have a leadership perspective. A lot of, <laughs> sometimes, in a, uh, sometimes uh, in another interview, my dear Rudy, I will comment you a, a top seller book in in the United States from from the end of the 20th century that is called "Why Businessmen Speak Like Idiots." Okay. <laughs> And, and, and we start, we want leadership. You want leadership? Then they stop saying, the, 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 what is the profile of a leader? And I want all my, my, my company, my team to have leadership. No. Leadership is built up by small things. It has to be focused. Okay? Let me tell you, we are not going to take the three disciplines of my model, but I, let me uh, talk to you a little bit about negotiation. What, is, what are leadership in negotiation? First thing, first step, the leader has to have the will, maybe not the knowledge, not the skill, the will, the purpose of negotiating, of not closing the door or not closing the, the dossier, of not closing. You have to have the leadership to negotiate. Second, you have, you require, sorry, you require the leadership to be yourself, to be authentic. I have a model in, in Spanish makes a lot of sense. It comes from Harvard University, Francis Lay, uh, that is called alegar. I don't know. You're you're the lawyer. What could be the best translation for alligator? Allegation to alligate to argue. Alligator. <laughs> argue. Argue will give you the sense, but alligate will give you the meaning of, of my acronyms. The first mm -hmm. A is authenticity. You have to be authentic. And a leader has to be authentic. The second letter is the L. The L goes for logic. You have you need logic, and that goes with science, okay? And then you have require empathy, and the other three we can leave it for for later or for another um, sure. talk and chat. Uh, but a leader has to be authentic. A leader has to be human, and not say let's be human. Everybody's we are human beings. What we're talking about, we are human beings. But being I human is to have. have to is humanity. He, a leader has to have some humanity about him. And that's empathy. Uh-huh. Empathy and humanity and, and have to understand where the others are coming from. It's interesting. The definition of leadership is autocratic or authoritarian, democratic, laissez-faire, let people do what they want, or basically <laughs> a paternalistic leadership, like a father and son type leadership trying to you know, a father trying to give advice to his son. But I agree with you that leadership is important and leadership is something that you have to show. Otherwise, if you're a business unit leader, if you're trying to implement a process in a company or in a factory, people have to respect you. 
right? They, they have to feel comfortable with you. And that's really also another sign of leadership. But your second skill set is communication. And that's one of my pet peeves. When I say pet peeves, it's one of the things that I, I say to people. Uh, just because you have breakfast, lunch, and dinner does not mean that you can run a restaurant. As much as I would like to have a little taco stand or hot dog stand somewhere and just talk <laughs> to people, it's 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 it doesn't mean you you run a restaurant because you eat. But just because you talk does not mean you can communicate. And I've come across so many people in my life that feel they're great communicators. But half the time you don't understand what they're saying. Half the time I don't think they understand what they're saying. Well, the problem is, is all right, huh? Communication is basically you have to to talk to people in a way that they understand you in their language. Okay? Your message has to be meaningful, mean something to the other. If you have a, you are saying something uh, uh, meaningless, the opposite, nobody will believe you. And that's where comes uh, the model I was talking about, the model allegal. The model is you have to be authentic. Okay. Our morphology, our corporal behavior, our eyes, even our eyes, will tell we're not authentic. Okay. So communication has to be very important. Uh, but to understand it uh, is our tool. It's the only way we can translate our measures, our ideas. I have a, a definition that I use uh, very often. I love it. It says that that communication is the wrap, is the box, is the gift wrap of our ideas. We can have great ideas, but if we don't wrap it and package adequately, we will not, not get anywhere. So communication is the wrap up is of our, the gift of our ideas. So we have All ideas. Right. Yeah. I really yeah. like that analogy. I think it's really good. It's you have to give it to them in the box so that they want to open it. They want to listen. They want to see it. So what that means is it's not just that you communicate, but also how you communicate. And wrapping how you is wrapping it in the box and giving it to them is, is to me, is the how. And the that's how, how you communicate, by giving them. Uh, people will treat you not as they see you. Exactly. We'll exactly. treat you as they feel you. And part of the communication is make, develop feelings in the other, in the way we do it. And have powerful communication, but meaningful messages, pertinent messages. Talk to people what they are interested in. That's how the, the, the news are, are built up over more than one century. What people want to hear. They want to hear traffic. They want to hear the weather. And they don't care if Donald Trump is doing that or Biden is not doing it. They want to hear something meaningful for their lives. When are I going to get money? When are I going to get jobs? So that's the problem with some politicians. They speak, they talk, they give reports. Businessmen, why businessmen speak like idiots? Because they make graphics and reports and for all the visual support you want to, to put on, but they're not transmitting a message because it's not meaningful. It's not useful. It's not getting into the hearts. Enchantment is one of my favorite books from Guy Kawasaki. Enchantment is how to gain people's minds, people's heart, and people's wills. So that's why communication is the sister of leadership. If you can gain the mind, the heart, and the will of others, you're a leader. So if you don't have a good communication, you're not a leader. But that takes practice, Gerardo, and that's where people, I think, fall short. 
So for example, I've given, I do like you, I do a lot of conferences and presentations and I've done four TED talks, TEDx talks. And if anything I've learned from giving presentations is that people want to be entertained. It's one thing to talk about the subject matter. So for example, I could say to you, a box of movie theater popcorn has 35 grams of saturated fat. But if I tell you a box of movie theater popcorn has more saturated fat than a bacon and egg breakfast, a McDonald's Big Mac, and a steak dinner, that's going to register with you. So people often think, I've got this information, but they don't focus necessarily on how to present it. And that's where the communication gets lost. Well, there is an example. Uh, William Randall Hertz, New York Times, the beginning of the 20th century, said nobody cares about some things. If, if, if you want to, to really link, cap the attention of people, you, it's the way you say it. I'm going to say that the, the war is, is going to end. The, 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 we're going to get out of this universe. If you put that in a headline, said, tomorrow the earth will be destroyed. Not tomorrow, I sorry. I just missed it. The world will be destroyed. Big letters. And in the bottom, you put in thousands of millions of years. Nobody will read the one down. They will read, we have a problem. It will be destroyed. The, 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 the world will be destroyed. And secondly, the most marvelous, powerful, meaningful, success in the in the universe is that the sun rises daily and nobody cares but it's common so if you 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 have to make a sense of urgency what is called the alert if you want to go into change management you start with the alert you see in the in the cigarette boxes this contains this 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 again numbers statistics whatever in Mexico, they put, I don't know, I don't smoke. I don't know the culture. They put uh, dead rats and whatever. What's happening there? People will not stop smoking with those messages. People will start will start a program when they say, you're going to die. Look at your lungs. These are your lungs. Okay? Your, not the rat, not other one, uh, other people who lumps. This is your lumps. You're gonna die. You have to be precise. Get to the people. Okay. The great leaders and communicators were uh, making the link immediately. Presidents of the United States, work it out. Remember, uh, Mr. Bill Clinton is the economy. Okay. But sure. I'm Obama. Even Trump, let's make America great again. There is no strategy. There is nothing out of this world. It's what meaningful messages. Okay, so it's it's a challenge. I agree with you. It's a challenge, but everybody says, "What do you want to be? I want to be happy." If you make a consensus in the world, everybody wants to be happy. Hey, speakers. Make people happy. <laughs> well, but I think what you're talking about is communication with the masses and how you get the masses to pay attention. And, and, and so newspapers and, and television newscasts always have those little catchphrases. But when you're talking in, in the world of, of business and you're talking to other professionals, you still need the same type of methodology in communication because you can have a hundred people in in the room and talk to them about supply chain management or talk to them about process and, and they may tune you out in a matter of minutes. That's um, right. And, that point. Mm -hmm. and that's why three three basic not exclusive but basic rules is Meaningful, specific, 
and with purpose. What's in it for me? Okay. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You're gonna, okay, you're gonna you're gonna sell a contract. What's in it for me? In pro side, we call it WIF. What's in it for me? Okay. You well, have to transmit uh -huh. that to one person, many persons, a whole group. But when you're face to face, you have a better chance if you understand the uh, the counterpart to 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 learn. That's the word. What's important for the other part, in particular, and the three roles will apply. Of course, will apply. Meaningful, significant, and direct. Well, let's let's use my English, not my, the best one, but don't give me bullshit. Is the people yeah. doesn't want to be bullshitted. And, and as exactly. a matter of fact, this book, exactly, this book, exactly. And, and you, as a matter of fact. This book says how to be the bullshit bullfighter. And I love <laughs> it. I try every day to be the bullshit bullfighter. And as people in the street say in the United States, don't don't bullshit the bullshitter, okay? Yeah, that's a very common expression here. Well, well Gerardo, your other skill sets are art and strategy. And, and I Science. think that art, that art is pretty self-explanatory because... When you're dealing with people, it's oftentimes, you know, hit and miss. You learn these processes as you go along, and then you have to adapt to what what connects with them, which means knowing your audience. Uh, but to me, the 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 thing I want to focus on more is the strategy because to me, that is the most important aspect of of everything you've said, and the reason it's important for me is that you have to go into a situation knowing exactly what you want, okay? You have to know, so, if you're going to invent the process, you have to know what is that process you want. Let me share with you and your audience uh, my perspective. My perspective more than a strategy, because it's an OTC, over-the-counter solution for companies, countries, and whatever. We uh -huh. need the strategy. We need leadership, and I'm. Uh, it's very interesting for me how you choose of, uh, these two concept of this of my model: first leadership and now strategy. Because everything, I I have fever. Let's get Tylenol. That goes another publicity. <laughs> Paracetamol, <laughs> okay? Ibuprofen, whatever, vitamin C. No. What is important for every person and is basic for 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 the team work for the companies for the big enterprises for the governments for any organization is not strategy as itself is strategic thinking and how strategic thinking starts what i want what i really want when i was in a slumber gym, one of the vice presidents was from england and was the time of the spicy girls, and this was a great song from the from those those great girls. And it said, "What I really, really, really want." And this vice president at this number is always started to motivate as a good leader the teams, saying, "What I really, really, really want." And everybody has to start. It's a great season for that. We're in January. What I really, really, really want. We have to make a distinction between objectives and goals because objectives are formed by what? What I want, the time that I'm gonna, time driven, has to be to have a goal and has to be very specific. And the most important of all, what are the key process indicators? Yes, I want to lose weight. I really need it. I don't want to really need it. How many pounds? What is your goal? How are you going to... Uh, you have to establish that very clearly. I want to lose weight. Is that a strategy? No, it's not a strategy. It's an objective. What is my goal? My perfect weight. Let's check the internet. 
This is my perfect way. I'm gonna get there. In what time? This month. That's why all uh, um, New Year objectives always fail. Most of the cases, sorry. Most of the cases. Because we don't put time, these four elements I'm saying. And then in that moment, you have to say, what is my strategy? My strategy is those objectives projected long term. And then you're not project that you're going to lose 20 pounds every year. What you have to project to yourself, that's come vision and mission for the companies and from the individuals also, uh, as well, is I want to have a healthy life. And that gives you the sense of purpose. So I have the objective of losing weight. I have clearly specified my indicator is the, the scale, the basket. Okay. But my strategy is to have a healthy life. That means that in one year, I would say, now I'm going to run. Now I'm going to swim. Now I'm going to have a, a, a healthy uh, diet. And that's if all of those objectives, as well, I'm relating them as tactics, come from a strategy. So a company said, my strategy is to lower prices. <laughs> That's yeah, not even you... an objective. Yeah. <laughs> That's not well, even an objective. No, I, I understand completely what you're saying. I, I think what happens, there's a difference between setting the goal and setting the strategy. That's so right. If, if your goal is, I'll give you another example. Let's say you want to be a millionaire. And you say, my goal is to be a millionaire. But you're you are making or earning fifty thousand dollars a year. Why not just say next year I'm going to earn a hundred thousand, and the year after that I'm going to earn a hundred and twenty thousand. But you set up a series of short-term goals, and that's the process that's going to get you to be the millionaire. So when you're thinking about, okay, I'm from fifty to a hundred thousand. What am I going to do? How am I going to do it? And then that's you that's can your, plan more specifically, right? You can plan more specifically if you go from your objectives that have goals, that have time driven, that have everything we said. And talking about a, a millionaire, you have to define what is a millionaire. You have to be very precise. There is a definition, well, from baby boomers that the great effort is to get to one million dollars. Then everything will start to build itself. Okay. Let's think for a moment in, in that matter. So I said, I want to have a million dollars. In what time? Okay. Basically, your strategy is to respond to yourself. What is my purpose? Because I, I and that will give you the, directly the strategy. I want healthy finances. I want meaningful finances. Okay. Objectives have a birth. Strategy is not necessary. <laughs> okay. well, and I, I think we can talk for hours on this, but what I want to ask you is, you, obviously companies are your clients, individuals are your clients. We've talked about a number of issues. We've talked about your, your five pillars, your five ideas, uh, basically your Bible when you are training people. But oftentimes these companies don't even know that they need the training and or or they don't necessarily value it because these people think they know everything they they um i'll give you a good example from the movie rocky um uh in the first movie rocky Polly says to sylvester stallone the rocky says i think i can make some money from your name can i do it he says yes and what well, how are you going to make money well advertising mm -hmm. well what's you know something about advertising yeah i know something about that so he goes off into the first fight with the name of a meat packing pant behind the um behind his robe and i think what what happens is people have a false sense that they know already and they don't know what they don't know 
You know what I'm saying? So you're trying to sell somebody on something that they don't know. You, you follow me? That they don't know they don't know. And that's got to be challenging for you. Well, when I give a uh, 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 keynote uh, conference, uh, and it's different, one individual to a group, a big group in a conference, I said, what is your, the purpose of your company and the nature of your business? And they say, well, I, I sell boxes. You sell boxes? That's the purpose of your minute are you doing what worry would you you about selling boxes uh, I go back to this idea uh, and I want to focus in the process of being a consultant people will say to me especially in training and executive education I need a course in negotiation or I need a course on sales or seminar or a workshop, and everyone will say, I can do it. I have 1,000 seminars on sale. I'm Carras. I can give you a, a seminar on, on negotiation. Do you really need negotiation? And you have to listen. Tell me why you think, not in that manner, not be offensive, but be very curious and why you want negotiation. And when people ask me, and I'm worried about my company, it's like a Wall Street movie or being a golf course. Gerardo, I'm worried about your my company. Okay, what worries you? Worry that I I want to leave the company in five years. Well, you need a process of outsource of your company. And you need a process, and people won't believe it until they give it in their words. We go back to communication, but also to saying what you really, really want. And people will say, what do you sell? It's like Starbucks. Starbucks doesn't sell coffee. Starbucks sells, no, there are a lot of things. There are a lot of knowledge about this. What do you really sell? What is the nature of your, of your business? What is the purpose of your business? And when you want to be a good consultant, you have to go, what is the urgency, your sense of urgency, and what is the purpose? Let me tell you one sense of urgency. I gave a seminar, a lot of seminars ending the year 2020 to General Motors about change management. What worry? What worries you, G GM? I'm worried because we have to go into electrical cars. Okay, you have to have a radical vision, and that's what I build. Have a radical vision. What is the imperative of business, and what is the purpose of the business? I'm getting into that. The imperative is Biden wants electrical cars. Okay, if you want to see it that way, and they will say, okay, let's be part of that. You have to have radical visions, but step-by-step -step solutions. But the first thing is you have to analyze what is imperative, what is the need, and what they really, really want. Sorry, I, I, I got I got no, lost in this. No, believe me, you're, I know you're passionate about it because I've heard your other talks, which is obviously one of the reasons why I wanted to interview you. I, I think uh, what you say makes a lot of sense. I, I think that, as I said before, people don't know what they don't know. And your job is to make sure they understand and explore the areas they don't know. When you look, for example, the case of Eastman Kodak. Eastman oh. Kodak, they, they, they lost out on the digital world. They could have had it. They could have had a jet wall. Another one is BlackBerry, right? BlackBerry thought that they were invincible. And and look, they're now barely in existence. I, I, I see once in a while somebody with a BlackBerry, but it's not the powerhouse it used to be because these people failed to innovate. They failed to implement new processes. They failed to understand their market demand. 
and, and what people want. And, and that's a leader losing touch with reality. I'm going to give you two words from my perspective. First one is fear. The second one is comfort, the son of comfort. What I have, why I have to get out of this business, what I have to change, the need for a change. Why? We're selling a lot. Everybody identifies we're a, we're a commodity. Blackberry is a commodity. Okay. And fear. There are a lot of companies, even industry segments that I have um, worked with. They say, no, 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 no. Don't change that. Why? It's not in our nature. It's like betraying my, my purpose. So I sell horses. Don't talk me of getting into, into automotive. I sell internal combustion by gasoline, diesel, vehicles. Don't get me into electrical. Why? It's not in my nature. When I read they are telling you they are afraid of changing. So you have to make them feel comfortable with change. So their son of comfort will eliminate that fear. And basically they challenge themselves. And secondly, as human beings, this is not a company decision. How your company works. That's something I learned at uh, Michigan University, go Wolverines. Um, how your company thinks. It thinks like the person who is leading that company. It was a Dow Chemical and our, and our CEO was an accountant. Well, your company thinks like an accountant or like an engineer or like a mechanical engineer, not any kind of engineer, <laughs> like a chemical engineer, like a lawyer. So don't fear, fearless in changing your mindset. But well, the only people, way to change that is to make, sorry, my Rudy, no, no. the only okay. way to make people fearless is to make them comfort with change. And you have to give small results, small sparks of success. Well, they're afraid of failure is what there is. They're making money. They, they're afraid to venture out into something. And I, I find that it's that fear that keeps them stagnant from producing. You know, another good example is IBM and, and Microsoft. You know, IBM contracts with, the, which was DOS, Disk Operating System, but IBM did not own the rights to DOS. And look what a mega giant Microsoft is. IBM is still a big giant. But what if somebody would have said, well, we're going to own the software. You develop it for us. Okay. You um, have to, to make a, to stop and think like, like a, a very good friend from Brazil was my boss and said, but APN says, stop and think. What is your, your long-term objective? What is your purpose? Companies are, are very, had a lot of pressure about results in money. So if we do this, we're going to lose a lot of money. Could be. Okay. The fund starts when the company is going to the stock market. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And then and then we say, what my 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 stakeholders would think of it. What is changing the game? Companies that think more in older stakeholders and build up a stakeholders structure with more things, customers, employees, um, the environment, social responsibility will make a better vision, okay? But if you start I, with, okay, that's gonna cost a lot of money and we're gonna lose a lot of sales, and that's planned by scenarios, you say, okay, let's stay this way. They don't wanna bet. And I have been with customers in the United States. I don't want to bet. If, if I wanted to bet, I go to Las Vegas and I fix it up. Okay. But you have to bet. You have to bet. I read an article a few years ago, a number of years ago, about a provider to one of the biggest box retailers in the world. I mean, we know who they are. And, and in the article, he says that he, the decision he had to make was to stop selling 
to this big retailer. And, 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 and when he met with them, he was, they were going to increase the order, but he decided not to renew the order because the equipment he sold was high-end equipment. He had distributors all over the place. So they can go to this box retailer, buy, say, a, a, a not so good version of the lawnmower. Uh, and then the people who are loyal, who are buying his brand, are, you know, are, are basically getting the short end of the stick as an American expression. So when he decided not to sell anymore to this big box retailer, he saw that sales went up in other areas. But it's pretty risky to go to the biggest probably retail person in the world and say, I'm not going to do business with you. Because no, it's not good. Where, uh, you have to understand that it's not, you don't, you, you're irresponsible when you make blind bets. But you also have to understand, but one kind of bet, one type of bet is not betting. And that goes, you have a great example that I want to really uh, get to the bottom to puntualize it. Michael Porter, the great master in strategy and competitive adventure said, the essence of strategy is to decide what not to do. Okay. Or as Thomas Edison said, I didn't fail a thousand or ten thousand times. I just found out how many times it wasn't going to work. And you have to make bets. You have to experiment. You have a lot of things. And you have a lot of opportunities to experiment. Perhaps, well, General Motors is not betting everything on electrical. That's that's our friend Elon Musk. Okay. General Motors is still having, but on when you see that F, the F-150, the Wrangler, and all those, the big uh, trademarks in automobiles go to electrical, something is happening. They're not putting all their, their, their vehicles in electrical. They're going step by step. Execution is the name of the game, and you have to go step by step. But your vision has to be radical. Einstein... We, well, we can start closing with that. I stand said that you cannot solve a problem when the same mindset that built it. Exactly. Uh, and, and, and they and, also and say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. If you combine those into a in, um, uh, into with a customer at the board executive board and say, well, I'm a consultant. You know who I am. You, you have the data. I'm here for one reason. So if you're not going to do anything, the results will be the same. At least give me the opportunity to make sense of... Uh, uh, sorry. Make good sense, common sense, propositions to you and decide what to do and what not to do okay and that's not just the numbers it's not just opinions good arguments is the best strategy there is and it's built in good ideas put to work okay these are the arguments and let's try try to build it up well um i don't know um <laughs> We have been talking for an hour. You are from Puerto Rico. I, I'm, I'm a health speaker. We can both are professional speakers. We can be here. There was a, let me, but I, wanted, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to thank you so much for agreeing to do this. It was very informative for me and I'm sure for, for my audience. But I also wanted to, I put your website up there. Uh, if, if anyone wants to reach you and see what kind of services you provide, they can feel free to contact you at, at the website below. Uh, you do live in Ensenada. I, I have fond memories of Ensenada. I used to go there a lot in my other life, and I had the famous fish tacos along the <laughs> wharf. I, would eat. I was in Ensenada once during the uh, Baja 500 race, and I saw all those street vehicles. So maybe one day I'll get a chance to go visit you. So well, I, I really, I, huh? Go ahead. Business are business. I live in Tijuana, and I really from Tijuana, but I was born in Ensenada. But I go okay. 
the same reasons and for business reasons to buy the Guadalupe, great wine, is like Sonoma Valley. And I go for other reasons uh, regarding uh, uh, business. So I'd be glad to take the challenges. Everybody wants to work and to have uh, projects, but, I, but I'm willing to take challenge even for free <laughs> uh, to really help, make a contribution. So you can go uh, more important than selling my services, selling whatever I can built up for people is to communicate this this website that uh, thank you for providing the info will give you the opportunity you. to communicate directly with me and you can ask propose not agree agree or whatever or invite me invite me some fish tacos and cervezas or whatever you want to to name it. There is an expression that uh, I really don't think that way, but it's very funny. In Spanish, for our speaking, uh, uh, Spanish speaking audiences, si favores no hago, desprecios menos. Rudy. If I don't do any favor, favor, then I am not appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> okay, was a great talk. Gerardo's website is down there. Please click if you want more information. I can tell you that Gerardo has an excellent seminar on negotiation. Price is very reasonable. Click there and learn more about how you can enroll in his seminar. I, I, I went through it. Even with all the experience I have, I learned a lot from you in that seminar, Gerardo. Thank you so Thank much. You, and again, if you enjoyed the interview with me and Gerardo, Please subscribe and you will see more videos. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Gerardo. I appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend or whatever you see this interview. And Rudy, very thankful to you.